Hey, this episode of The Anxious Truth is brought to you by me, because this is not just a podcast. There are actually some books that go with it. I am the author of three books on anxiety and anxiety recovery, and I think you would really find them helpful. So if you don't have them already, head on over to theanxioustruth.com slash books where you can learn more about them. Hey, what up, everybody? Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of this fine program. This is episode number 184, entitled Learning to Live Recklessly. That's right. You heard me. Recklessly. That might be a little bit of clickbait, but you'll see. There's a reason why I named the episode Learning to Live Recklessly. Before we get into it, if you are new here, The Anxious Truth is a podcast dedicated to all things anxiety and anxiety recovery. So panic and panic attacks, agoraphobia, monophobia, OCD, social anxiety, GAD. If it's anxiety, it's here. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you are not new and you are a regular listener to the podcast, thank you very much for your support. I appreciate you coming back every week and spending time with me. I really do. So let's talk about this. Why did I name this episode Learning to Live Recklessly? So if you're watching on video, which by the way, on Spotify, it's video now. So right below me there, it says learning to live recklessly. And you can find the show notes for this episode at theanxioustruth.com slash 184, by the way. But uh, if you are here and listening, why am I using a, the word reckless? Like, What's up with this guy? Why is this crazy dude with a microphone telling me to live recklessly? So we would all agree that if you went up to somebody on the street and say, hey, what does it mean to live recklessly? Or what is, what's reckless? Name me some reckless stuff. The average person on the street corner would say skydiving or cliff jumping or bungee jumping or, I don't know, motorcycle racing or something like that. You know, so dangerous stuff. What are the uh, Alaskan king crab fishing, most dangerous profession in the world, whatever it is. So people would name really dangerous things where like you're taking your life in your hands. Something could go seriously wrong. You know that you're doing it anyway. You're being intentionally putting yourself in danger or other people. You might, you might, reckless often comes with the idea of being irresponsible. That's so irresponsible. That's so reckless. Like you could get hurt. Somebody can get hurt. So most of us would agree like that the term reckless involves doing dangerous things intentionally and being somewhat irresponsible. And to a certain extent, I want to relate that to the recovery process. When you do the hard and scary things that we talk about as part of the recovery process, it feels really dangerous. And you may have resistance to that, not only because nobody wants to do scary and hard things, but at like it's sort of an ethical and moral level, you might feel, no, no, that feels so wrong. That feels irresponsible. That feels reckless. So while I'm kind of doing a little bit of clickbait using the word, you know, the, the title learning to live recklessly, in many, many ways, the process of recovery actually feels that way for people like us. We're not truly doing dangerous things. We're not like, you know, motorcycle racing and cliff diving. We're not. But in the position that we wind up in, when we stop trying to save ourselves from anxiety and the sensations and symptoms and thoughts and compulsions and rituals and habits that come with it, when we stop trying to protect ourselves from that threat that our amygdala says exists but doesn't, when we stop trying to protect ourselves against the threat that feels wrong. Not only is that difficult, counterintuitive, scary, it feels like you shouldn't do that. That feels dangerous. It feels irresponsible. It feels reckless. So the process of doing scary, difficult, hard things as part of recovery, going down the path to recovery, really is very much learning to live recklessly. It's just our interpretation of what reckless is. To people like us that are in the thick of an anxiety disorder, it feels reckless to do these things. It feels dangerous. It feels irresponsible. Like, I, I can't do that. That would be so irresponsible. This comes up often. I will use health anxiety as, a, as an example here. If you have health anxiety, I've heard people get very angry at my suggestion that you shouldn't be Googling your symptoms and calling for doctors every four days to check that the latest health scare that you think you have. And sometimes they get really angry about that, number one, because they certainly don't want to be ill or, or die from some illness that is undiagnosed. Of course, nobody does. But they will say, I can't afford to take this chance. I have kids or I have a business or I have a, a, a spouse. I have a partner. I have a family. That's irresponsible. They will, they will sometimes counter my suggestion 
that dealing with their health anxiety is going to mean living with the uncertainty that you think you might have some disease that a doctor has never been able to diagnose. You're going to have to live with that uncertainty that maybe you do. That seems so irresponsible. Now, I can't take that chance. I have kids. Feels irresponsible, feels dangerous, feels wrong, feels reckless to do that. A responsible parent would let themselves die. I get that. I really do. And that becomes one of the one of the arguments against doing that. If you are in the generalized anxiety disorder camp, if you are dealing with GAD, and it is driven by being an overthinker, a ruminator, an over planner, a problem solver, a fixer, the person who gets things done. I'm the glue of this family, everyone relies on me, I have to be the responsible one. Or you're a warrior, you're a chronic warrior, I have to worry about my kids worry about my kids all the time, worry about my health, worry about finances, worry about my job, worry about my husband, my partner, my, my, my wife, worry about my boyfriend, my girlfriend, worry about my dog, worry about everything. I just worry about everything. Worry about the economy, worry about the climate. If you are a constant ruminator and warrior, then when you disengage from that process and allow your, allow your worry to go unanswered, that feels so irresponsible. So not only is it difficult because of the discomfort it creates, but it feels morally, ethically, I don't know what word we want to use from a core value standpoint, it feels irresponsible and reckless to do that. If we want to relate this to things like panic disorder and agoraphobia, like, okay, you avoid anything that might trigger a panic attack or panic symptoms at all costs. When we start going toward those things, and we stop trying to keep it from happening, keep it at bay, soothe it, knock back the symptoms, like make it end immediately. When we stop trying to escape from it or avoid it, that's super feels scary. That's really difficult to do counterintuitive and difficult makes you scared and uncomfortable. And sometimes the resistance is even more than just that scary. That feels wrong. That's the wrong thing to do. That's irresponsible. It's dangerous and reckless. So I think when I talk about learning to live recklessly, we're just kind of acknowledging that extra layer of resistance that sometimes comes along with doing the opposite, taking opposite action, going toward the fear, intentionally creating fear and discomfort and uncertainty and vulnerability. That's part of the recovery process. Not only is that just difficult at face value to do, but it may strike you as being completely wrong, irresponsible and reckless to a certain degree. So if you're feeling that, you are not alone, especially, especially if you're dealing with sort of mental and thinking habits that are attached to emotional things like love and caring. So if you are a fixer, the problem solver, I'm the people pleaser, I keep the family together, everyone relies on me. I have a job to do. I have to keep my family safe. I have to keep everybody happy. I have to make everybody happy. I have to care. I have to love them. I have to worry about them especially when you are being ruled by those types of mental and thinking habits that are driven by that sort of thing. I'm a warrior. I, I'm just a warrior. I have to worry. I, I have to, how can I not worry? How can I not worry about, let's take parenting, for instance, I'm a parent. I have two girls. Like, how can I not worry about my kids? I'm supposed to worry about them. I worry about them all the time. And you can recognize that your worry habit is driving you to the brink you know it's not working out for you, yet you may hang on to it because you confuse worry with love and caring. I did a whole podcast episode on worry and worrying that you can look up on my website. Go to theanxioustruth.com and search for worry, and you will find one of my most popular episodes on worry and worrying. So when you get into that there, you can listen to that there. But you will often hang on to those mental thinking habits because you either think they are part of what defines you as a productive person, an achiever, an expert. Uh, as worthy, as valid, as a, as a productive member of your family or your company or your social group, like you, you really kind of nail sometimes your identity to those maladaptive thinking habits and mental habits that are making you crazy, but at the same time, you want to hang on to them. So when you start to do things that let them go and you let the thinking habits go unanswered, you leave questions unsolved, you leave problems unsolved, questions unanswered, questions unasked. You leave worry unanswered. I'm worried because it is a little bit cold out, which means the roads might be icy, which means my son is out driving. And I leave that. I leave that unanswered. That feels 
irresponsible and wrong and reckless. And it's important to understand that. So, you know, kicking your feet back, having a glass of wine and watching a movie while your your son is out driving in what could be icy roads would feel so irresponsible, so irresponsible. But what we are trying to learn in this example on the path to recovery is that there's really no difference between you, you know, watching a movie while your son drives home in the winter weather or sitting at the kitchen table and wringing your hands and worrying because sitting at the kitchen table and worrying and working yourself up into that crazed state, that, an that anxious state that you hate so much and you're trying to get out of, I, I can't stop my worry. How do I get out of this worry cycle? You know you want to stop, but yet you will cling to that and say, I, I, I can't leave that worry unanswered. I'm, I'm, I'm the mom. I'm the dad. I have to worry. Well, you don't. I'm the boss. I have to solve all the problems. I'm the doer. I got to get things done. I'm the glue. I got to keep the family happy and together. No, you don't. You actually don't because you're not doing that anyway. I have to stay home. I can't go out of the house because I might panic. That's not safe, but it's always been safe. So in this context, when I say we are learning to live recklessly, I'm just trying to expose that extra layer of resistance to going toward the fear and doing things that are counterintuitive and difficult and uncomfortable and scary. You may reject them because everyone rejects scary stuff and hard stuff. That's true. You may reject them at another layer because they feel just wrong and reckless. Reckless is I'm intentionally doing something that I know I'm not supposed to do. Not just as difficult to do, but I'm not supposed to do it. I'm not supposed to let myself panic. I'm not supposed to let myself be afraid. I'm not supposed to let myself have a stroke or a heart attack, even though you've never actually had one. So we are learning to live recklessly because the only way to know that it's not reckless is to be reckless and find out, right? So again, it's super important for me to say as many times as I can here, I'm not talking about cliff diving and bungee jumping. I'm not telling you to do dangerous things, but it may feel to you extremely dangerous, extremely irresponsible, and extremely reckless. But the only way to know that that is not reckless behavior is to do the behavior and see that nothing bad happens. So you're not playing Russian roulette here. You're just allowing reality to creep in, override that, that overactive threat response that drives those, those habits and those safety habits of yours. And you're going to force feed reality to your lizard brain. I did not sit at the table and worry for three hours. And Timmy made it home anyway. That's the lesson that we need to learn. So we can only learn when we, when we have to do scary and hard things to recover. We do scary and hard things to learn that they were never, they never had to be scary. They are, but the experience of doing a scary and difficult thing is to teach us that it doesn't have to be scary or difficult. So we will act what we think is recklessly to learn that we're not truly acting recklessly because we were never stopping disaster anyway. We weren't being responsible at all. We weren't doing the right thing at all. Excessive worrying and rumination is not the right thing. Excessive problem solving and the need to know and predict and, and figure things out because you think that keeps you safe is not the right thing to do because it doesn't actually keep you safe from anything. Refusing to go to the supermarket by yourself because you think that a panic attack is going to be the death of you or you won't be able to handle it in the frozen food section is not correct. That is not the right thing to do. So we have to uncover that fallacy, that mistake by doing the wrong things. So these are scary things and difficult things, and they will feel like the wrong things. They will feel reckless and irresponsible. So we are, in many measures, learning to live recklessly. Now, the rest of the world will look at us and say, are you kidding me? You're kidding, right? Like you, you watch the movie instead of sitting at your kitchen table worrying and you think that's reckless, they would laugh at us. And I understand that. I totally get that. By the, the definition of reckless, you know, that we accept overall in society, they would look at us and say, not, you're not doing anything reckless. Wait, you drove around the block, you walked to the mailbox and picked up your mail. Ooh, daredevil. You know, I get that. So, of course, I'm not telling you to do truly reckless things. I'm not asking anybody to jump out of planes here. But we need to do things that feel wrong and reckless. They're dangerous, they're scary, and they feel wrong and reckless. We need to do them so that we learn that they're not dangerous. We don't have to be scared of them. And they weren't. That's not reckless. And it's not wrong. Because the old habits were not right. 
we have to learn that by by taking that opposite action, right? We have to learn that by going into the recklessness, into the irresponsibility. I'm gonna be irresponsible tonight. I guess I'm gonna be irresponsible and reckless tonight. And in the end, you have to learn that lesson reality will hand us, which is that wasn't reckless at all. Nothing happened. Oh, nothing happened. Just because I thought that I was, you know, like my brain was somehow stopping some disaster by worrying and thinking and analyzing and problem solving. It, it wasn't doing anything because when I stopped doing that, nothing bad happened. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. I stopped trying to save myself from a panic attack and I panicked and I didn't die. I didn't go crazy. I didn't pass out. I didn't lose control. I didn't go insane. Nothing happened. So I guess I didn't have to do that stuff all this time. That's what we're trying to learn. But we have to act what feels to be reckless and irresponsible many times to do that. Hence the name of the podcast episode, episode 184, learning to live recklessly so that we learn that we're not really living recklessly at all. And you know what? Maybe you'll recover and you'll become a skydiver. That might be. Maybe that'll become one of your new hobbies. Maybe you will truly become a daredevil. Maybe not. But that's not what we're talking about here. So I, I hope that's been helpful. I feel like I rambled and ranted a little bit, but it's important to recognize to sort of sum that up, sum this up, that often the resistance to the, re the path of recovery is not not only that they are scary and difficult things, which is automatic resistance, we all resist that, but you may have that additional layer of resistance because it feels like the wrong thing to do. It feels irresponsible and reckless. So yes, go ahead and be irresponsible and be reckless. Or what your brain, your overactive, exhausted, overprotective, oversensitized lizard brain is telling you is irresponsible and reckless. Go ahead, go be that. Go ahead, because you're not. That's not irresponsible or reckless. Okay, so that's that's where the reckless part comes in in this episode. So there you go. I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm trying to keep in 15, 20 minutes. It seems to be working out pretty well that way. Hope you guys are liking the shorter format. I uh, that's it. That's it. I'm done. I'm not going to say the word reckless anymore. That was the last time. So thanks for coming by and listening. I appreciate that. You get Afterglow cooking here. Afterglow was written by my buddy Ben Drake. It was actually inspired by this podcast, so it's a special tune for both of us. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. What a surprise. I'm going to ask you, uh, if you haven't checked out my books, then go to theanxioustruth.com slash books and check out what I got. It's good stuff. If you're reading them and you dig them, write reviews on Amazon. That really helps me out in a big way. And let's see, what else can I tell you? What do I usually ask you to do? If you're watching on YouTube, hit like and subscribe. And if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes or some form, uh, some platform that lets you rate and review, leave a five-star review. Take a minute or two, write a review for us. It helps other people find the podcast, which means more people get help. And really, that's why I'm doing this. So thanks again for coming by. I appreciate you guys. I will see you again next week. Enjoy the music on the way out. And remember, remember, this is the way. It's in these feelings that you never show. Yeah, you're doing fine. It's all around you. You can breathe it in. This is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're gonna win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. <laughs>